Good evening, I'm Jennifer Rabb, and I have the enormous privilege of serving as the president of Hunter College, where the American dream continues to come true on campus and online. As regular Roosevelt House attendees know, keeping that vital dream alive in our city depends in large measure on our civic engagement and public participation. And in this critically important election season, New Yorkers are called to thoughtfully engage in local races and to do our part to wisely choose New York's next top officials. Of course, that significant responsibility and invaluable opportunity takes on additional importance after a year like we have just lived through. After a pandemic and during an ongoing reckoning on racial justice, we have a unique chance this June to look together to a healthier and more harmonious future. To help us make the best choices to get us there, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second in a series of Roosevelt House campaign forums. This one focusing on the Manhattan District Attorney's race. These forums are intended to engage candidates for public office with a series of questions from our Hunter students who are in some cases first-time voters, as well as the broader Hunter community. And there could be no better place from which to host such a conversation than Roosevelt House. Over the years, it has seen many lively, even heated discussions and debates, including, of course, between the power couple who once lived here, Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt. It was at Roosevelt House during another period of unprecedented challenge that they worked together individually and together to address the issues that would play so large a role in determining the well-being of New York and the nation. It was from here that Governor Roosevelt decided to address what he felt was the failure of a one-time Manhattan District Attorney who had botched a high-profile murder case. FDR took matters into his own hands, leading before long to the resignation of Mayor Jimmy Walker. Now, I'm not suggesting to this year's candidates that we're facing similar turmoil, but there's no doubt that the office of the Manhattan DA has always been in the spotlight, and sometimes in the crosshairs too. It is a tough, tough job. This evening, the 2021 candidates from Manhattan DA have joined us to share their key positions and priorities, both internally for the office itself and outwardly on the issues paramount to law enforcement and criminal justice. After 12 years under the DA Cyrus Vance Jr., and before that, more than three decades under his predecessor, Robert Morgenthau, Manhattan voters will now select a new district attorney likely to shape criminal justice policy for years to come. With no term limits, the DA's office is among the most influential and consequential positions in our entire government. And remember, this race does not fall under the new ranked choice voting system. With at least eight candidates in the field, every single vote will count. So this is truly an important forum. And we could not be more pleased that our students will lead the discussion. While Hunter students come from every community in every borough, we all converge on our Manhattan campus, virtually and hopefully soon in person, making Manhattan a second home for many of our students. So the plans and priorities of the next Manhattan DA will undoubtedly have an effect on each of us. That is why we could not be more grateful that you are with us tonight, candidates, to share what the office should look like in your vision and why you should be elected to lead it. We are so fortunate here at Hunter to have shared rewarding relationships with previous DAs. Hunter College was so fortunate to have bestowed an honorary degree on DA Robert Morgenthau. Then, in 2018, when he was 99 years old, we invited him back to Hunter, to Roosevelt House, so we could name the East Stairway in his family's honor. Decade earlier, it was up those same stairs at Roosevelt House that his father, who was FDR's Treasury Secretary-designate, Henry Morgenthau, 
galloped each morning of the 1932-1933 presidential transition to give FDR his wise counsel on the country's economic crisis. These ceremonies were unforgettable, featuring recollections from Bob Morgenthau about barbecues he remembers with FDR at Hyde Park. D.A. Cy Vance was on hand to help Hunter honor Bob Morgenthau by naming this staircase, and we have been proud at Hunter College to launch with D.A. Vance's office a crime prevention program known as the Navigators. Hunter College hopes to have the opportunity to work with one of tonight's candidates as our new DA. Until then, and in keeping with the historic Hunter motto, Mihi Cora Futuri, the care of the future is mine, we look forward to hearing from each of you as we strive together to care for the future of our hometown. To serve as our moderator tonight, I could not be more pleased to welcome back journalist and very talented interlocutor, Rachel Holliday-Smith, the Manhattan reporter for The City, New York's independent nonprofit local newsroom. With more than a decade on the local news beat, Rachel's experience includes work as a producer for Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and New York One. And her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Cranes, and the Gotham Gazette. Rachel, thanks again for being with us to steer this important discussion. We welcome you and all the candidates for Manhattan District Attorney to this virtual Roosevelt House stage. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to a lively and insightful discussion and honor all of your commitment to public service. To launch our program and introduce the candidates, I'm delighted to turn the program over to Rachel Holiday Smith. Thank you, President Rob, and welcome to everyone watching tonight. It looks like we have more than 200 people on this Zoom, and I just love when people are engaged and ready to learn about candidates. I'm Rachel Holiday Smith, the Manhattan reporter for The City. We are a nonprofit news website. We are reader supported and independent, and you can read our work at thecity.nyc. Um, so thank you for to all the candidates for being here tonight. And we've got a lot of topics to get to, so let's begin and try to cover as much as we can. Uh, most of our questions tonight will come from Hunter College students, um, but we'll also open up the floor for questions from the audience. So if you're watching, be ready to um, type a question into the Q&A function, not the chat, don't type it into the chat, but the Q&A function. And in the latter half of the program, we may take a question from you. Um, so, and a piece of housekeeping for the candidates, um, we will have a timer on the screen to remind you to keep to time. Um, I will verbally cue you if you go over, but just try to keep your eye on the clock so that we can get to as many questions as possible. So let's meet our Democratic candidates for Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, candidates, I just simply wave while I introduce you and then we'll go through and do opening statements after I go through the list. So in alphabetical order, here are our candidates. Please welcome Tahini Abushi, a criminal and civil rights attorney. Alvin Bragg, the former Chief Deputy Attorney General for New York State and earlier an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District. Please welcome Liz Crotty, a former Assistant District Attorney in Manhattan and now Criminal Defense Attorney. And we're joined by Tali Farhadian Weinstein, former general counsel with the Brooklyn District's Attorney's Office and a former um, US Attorney's Office in the Eastern District. Diana Florence is here with us tonight, former assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office, and she led our its construction fraud task force. Lucy Lang is here tonight, a former ADA in Manhattan as well, and director, former director of the Institute for Innovation in Prosecution at CUNY's John Jay College for Criminal Justice. Please welcome Eliza Orleans, a public defender for the Legal Aid Society, and I can't help but also say that she was a reality show um, star on Survivor and Amazing Race, just a really fun fact. Um, and lastly, we have Dan Court, who is the state assemblyman for the Upper East Side and a member of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. So welcome to you all. So I'm gonna reiterate just a PSA before we get to the candidates. Um, President Rob mentioned this, but I will mention it again because it bears repeating. This contest is not a ranked choice voting contest. So just keep that in mind when you go to the ballot box. You will have to choose your favorite here. There is no ranking. 
And if you already knew that, tell your friends who may not know that. Um, so let's begin with opening statements. We randomized the speaking order before the event began. So we are going to start with Eliza Orleans. And Eliza, you've got 30 seconds to introduce yourself and then I'll go down the line for introductions from everyone else. Go ahead. Fantastic. Well, thanks for the introductions, Rachel, and thank you, Hunter, for hosting us tonight. I'm Eliza Orleans. I'm the only public defender running for Manhattan District Attorney, and I'm the only one who spent my career in the trenches going up against the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. I have represented more than 3,000 people here in Manhattan, and I've seen the cruel, unjust way our criminal legal system operates, and I know that we can do better. We need a district attorney who is not only authentically committed to bringing about these reforms to bring Manhattan to the right side of history, but who also understands how to implement those reforms. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Liz Crotty. You have 30 seconds. Thanks so much for having me. I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney because I think public safety matters in every neighborhood. Since the beginning of this campaign, I talked about bringing back anti-crime to fight gun violence. I wrote an op-ed about putting uh, 500 police officers in the subway. And I talked about a COVID recovery and how we need law and order to bring people back to New York. I understand the Manhattan DA's office as an institution and what the, the uh, levers of change are necessary while maintaining public safety. I plan to manage this job from the top as someone who understands what happens on a day-to-day -day level. Thanks. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Ms. Florence, Diana Florence. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. I'm the proud daughter of Hunter class of 1963, a year before they started admitting men. Um, I'm running for Manhattan DA to fight for the people who never thought they'd win. It's what I did for 25 years. And, you know, when I announced my candidacy back in August, I said that one of my main goals was to make sure that people are safe at home, safe at work and safe on the street. But it doesn't just mean what we think traditionally. It means being safe from both being robbed, but also being hit by a brick from a construction site. I understand this job because I did it for 25 years. And I'm excited to tell you my vision for the office. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Alvin Bragg. You have 30 seconds. Thanks so much uh, for having me. Uh, hello to the Hunter community. Uh, my name is Alvin Bragg, and I'm running for Manhattan DA in large part because of early experiences growing up in Harlem. I had a gun pointed at me six times, three by NYPD officers during lawless stops, and three by people who were not police officers. As a result of those experiences, for the past 20 plus years, I've been fighting for both civil rights and public safety in the courtrooms. Uh, I look forward to talking to you tonight about my vision of how we have a safer and fairer Manhattan for all. Thank you. Tahani Abushi, you're next with 30 seconds. Thank you so much. Well, um, for me, I experienced the damage and destruction that this system can cause firsthand uh, at 14 years old when my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. It's why I became a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, to battle some of the worst abuses of our systems from police violence, discrimination, while also representing victims of sexual assaults and our children in suspension hearings. So as the next district attorney of Manhattan, I'm going to shrink the footprint of this office, put no badger bank account above the law and invest resources in our communities to ensure the stability and safety of everyone. Thank you so much. So let me remember Dan Court, you're next. Thank you so much and great to be back with uh, my Hunter College, uh, which I'm lucky enough to represent in the state legislature. Um, I've been a practicing attorney for 23 years and at the forefront of criminal legal reform in the state legislature. And I'm running to be your district attorney for two reasons. The scope of that experience in changing the law, not just the rhetoric of criminal justice reform, but actually achieving it. In 23 years, both in the court, civil court, criminal court, and 10 years in the legislature, achieving real results for people. And I look forward tonight to talking how we achieve both the reform we want and ensuring a level of public safety throughout Manhattan. Thank you very much. Lucy Lang and then Tali will go next. Lucy, you can go ahead. Good evening, Hunter College. I'm so thrilled to be with you back at Roosevelt House. I have run a national criminal justice reform organization out of CUNY. I served as an assistant district attorney right here in Manhattan, handling the most serious, violent, and complex cases in our city. My campaign is informed by and supported by the people most directly impacted by the system, folks who have lost loved ones to police violence, who've experienced sexual violence, and the progressive prosecutors across the country who are leading the charge to reform the system. I'm dedicated to a district attorney's office that will be an engine for dismantling mass incarceration and reckoning with racial injustice. Thank you. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein. 
Good evening, Hunter College. This has been such a tough year and the recovery of New York City and indeed the American dream depends on safety, safety in the street, in your home, when you're commuting, when you are meeting the police and when you need to report a crime to the police. And I believe we can have safety and also a criminal justice system that is fair and that sees the humanity in every person and that is modern. We just need a leader who knows what she's doing. I've worked for three attorneys general, I've clerked at the Supreme Court, I've been a leader in city prosecution and I've prosecuted everything from murder to tax evasion. There's so much work to do, let's go. Thank you so much. So let's begin with our questions from our students at Hunter College. Our first questioner will be Chantal Polinski. You can come on screen now, Chantal. Um, there you are. So um, go ahead with your question and introduce yourself. And for the candidates, you will have one minute and 30 seconds for this question. And I will um, call you, we're gonna rotate the order. So, you know, one person doesn't get the first shot every single time and I'll, I'll call you as we go along. But Chantal, introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chantal Plinsky. I'm a student in the Macaulay Honors Program, class of 2022. And I'm also a Grove Fellow. I'm majoring in psychology, psychology and receiving my certificate in human rights. Thank you so much for having me here today. I would like to ask, why are you qualified to be a Manhattan district attorney at a time when law enforcement officials are being called on more than ever to balance public safety with equity and respect? Thank you, Chantal. And the first person to answer this question is Liz Crotty. Thanks so much for the question. Um, I think public safety uh, is of paramount importance is why I've been talking about it since the beginning of my campaign. Uh, what makes me qualified about this is two part. I'm born and raised here in New York. I understand what the nuances of being in New York and how it there, there are some unspoken things about how we all live here and what we need to know about the criminal justice system and how it works. But also too, I've worked within the system for 21 years. I was a DA for six years. And for the past 12 and a half years, I've been a defense attorney going against the system. But I think that we need to, I understand having listened to victims, represented defendants, worked with police officers, worked with ju judges and the defense bar being on both sides, that it's a system of all of us getting along, a system of all of us working together to maintain public safety. I understand this intrinsically from my work, and I think that's what makes me the most, best qualified for this job. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Diana Florence, you'll answer that question next, and I'll just remind, I'll say it again, which is how do you balance public safety with equity and respect? Thank you, Chantal. Yes, I, you know, for me, I spent 25 years doing the work. There are others in this race who spent their time burnishing their resume or doing things that were adjacent to criminal law. I think it's really important that you do the work in the trenches. And I didn't just do it the same old way, processing people like a justice factory. From the moment I started, I looked at the cases individually and I innovated. I worked not for, but alongside the people that I was serving. And that's the vision that I'll bring to the office. I understand that we can't wait for things to come to us. We can't wait till we see it on Twitter. We need to be going out into the community, learning what's going on on the ground and using the criminal law the way it's intended to bring justice, not for the rich and powerful, but for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alvin Bragg, you're next with Chantal's question. Thank you, Chantal. Uh, I, 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 I have lived at that balance that intersection, uh, which you talk about. I mean, I remember growing up in Harlem in the eighties, mapping out my way home, um, scared both of the police and of those who were looking to mug me. I've lived it my entire life. I started my opening by talking about six gunpoint incidents, three by the police and three not. So this, this is every day I'm living it now with my 11 year old son who uh, you know, didn't wanna wear a face mask at the beginning of COVID uh, because he was scared that the police might think he's a robber. Uh, my 15 year old daughters express similar things, but I've also done the work. Uh, I've done public safety cases. I've done some of the most sophisticated uh, drug trafficking cases. I've done cases involving guns. I've done cases involving heinous sex offenses. So I've done the public safety cases. I've also done the civil rights cases. I prosecuted an FBI agent for lying. Uh, when I was at the attorney general's office in leadership, uh, we issued a report on stop and frisk. We looked at all the data and showed that only 0.1% of the stops resulted in a conviction for a gun offense, which of course was uh, the thesis uh, for that mistaken uh, and racist policy. Uh, so I've lived it uh, and I've done the work 
And out of that work uh, and life experience, I've crafted a vision uh, for the Manhattan DA's office that will allow us to work with the NYPD, but to be independent and hold them accountable. Thank you for your question, Chantal. I think it is the premier issue in this race. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Tahani Abushi. Your response to Chantal. Yeah, I think um, we need to step back and understand the premise within which that we're answering this question. Uh, equity and public safety are not mutually exclusive. There must be equity in everything we do and must have public safety for everyone in every decision we make. And for me, having grown up with my father incarcerated and my mother essentially single-handedly raising 10 kids, I seen what it's like when people use fear mongering and pin the, the safety of one community upon the incarceration and criminalization of another community. We don't have to do that. We don't have to pick. Everyone can be safe. And my job as a civil rights attorney has been dissecting exactly how we accomplish that. And I'm the only candidate here that has changed policy, that has made systemic change with our NYPD, with our fire department, with our lawsuits against the Department of Education, going down to the, the school to prison pipeline and how suspension hearings are had, all the way up to when I'm representing victims of sexual assaults and they're completely ignored and cut out of the process. First and foremost, you need somebody that has walked in the shoes of those impacted by this office. The second, we need somebody that has not only a prosecutor track mind, someone that is gonna see this from a comprehensive perspective, that is gonna understand that the decision they make goes far beyond that office, comes into our communities and impacts every single aspect of life. And so we need somebody that is gonna accomplish those goals in co-governance with our community, that is gonna think outside the box, is gonna ensure the safety and stability and equity for everyone. Thank you. Assemblymember Dan Court, how do you balance public safety with equity and respect? Well, thank you for the question, Chantel. And um, I guess the, the question as I heard it was who is, what is the best qualified or why am I the most qualified? And it, I go back to the opening and President Rob um, said, uh, this is a tough, tough job. And it certainly is. So the question is, who is the right person to truly reform this office, reshape this office? And I would argue it's not a prosecutor. It's someone with a different set of experiences. And specifically, I would point to my experiences, not only in the courtroom, but as a legislator. Um, in 25 years in Albany, there have been only two pieces of legislation that have ever repealed any section of the penal law. I wrote both of them. One when there was a Democratic state Senate and one when there was a Republican. I have achieved success on criminal legal reform, have the experience in the courtroom, but most significantly, I've done this and achieved it and answered before actual voters on criminal justice reform. Um, it goes back to what President Rob was saying. I have the right to, I have the right experience and the right qualifications at this very moment to reform this office from bottom to top, both on criminal justice reform and on public safety. Thank you. Lucy Lang, same question to you. And a reminder, this is a minute and 30 seconds that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question, Chantal, which may be the most important and difficult question facing the next district attorney. I'm the right person for the job because I have worked to reform the system from inside and outside the system right here in Manhattan for my whole career. Many years ago, I handled a case when I was a homicide assistant district attorney in which two masked gunmen stepped out from behind parked cars on Upper Broadway on a snowy night and opened fire, hitting five people and killing one young man, a father of a three-year-old. Over the course of a very long investigation, I became close to his mother. The shooters were identified and brought to trial and a jury returned a verdict of guilty. The morning after the guilty verdict, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked her how she felt. And she responded, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys, referring to the two men who had just been convicted of murdering her son. Her generosity of spirit inspired me to create a first of its kind college and prison program to bring assistant district attorneys inside New York's prisons to work on justice reform alongside incarcerated New Yorkers. It is that kind of deep engagement with communities most affected that is going to put the district attorney's office on the right track to enabling us to dismantle mass incarceration, which must be the priority of the next district attorney. Thank you very much. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, your response to Chantal. Chantal, I love your question because it demonstrates an understanding that we can't make people choose. It's never fair to say to people, you can either have safety 
or you can have fairness and equity. Uh, you can either have, uh, if you don't like disrespectful policing, your other choice is to have no police at all. I've never thought that that choice should be put to people or needs to put to be needs to be put to people. And the reason that I think that I'm in the best position to do what you asked is because I've been doing it this throughout my career. You know, I think that I have worked for the national and the local leader who have demonstrated how we balance safety and fair, fairness, Eric Holder at the national level and Eric Gonzalez at the local level. And we used to ask ourselves in both, you know, in both of those jobs, and this is what I would ask myself as a Manhattan DA, how do I deliver on safety in a way that demonstrates equity? Who are the people who need us the most? who need us to deliver on their safety, whether it's the victim of hate crimes or gun violence or sexual assault, and to make sure that we are showing that we are working for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. And lastly, we'll hear from Eliza Orleans. John Hall, thanks for that question. And I think that for far too long, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has not balanced public safety and equity, and in fact, has been failing at both. Because as a public defender and as the only public defender in this race, I've seen over and over and over again the way in which the arrests that are made, the prosecutions that are brought are not keeping us safe and they're unequitable, you know, unjust, and they're destroying families and ruining people's lives. I remember my first year as a public defender, I represented a man who was an assistant manager to Gristides in Lower Manhattan. And one night he locked up the store at 11 o'clock at night. He bought two bags of groceries with his employee discount and walked over to the A train to head home uptown. He was in an uncrowded subway car and set his groceries on the seats next to him. At 125th Street, two uniformed NYPD officers got on the train, grabbed his groceries, dumped them to the ground, placed him in handcuffs and took him to jail for the night for the crime of occupying multiple seats on the subway, taking up two seats on the train. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office prosecuted that case. They wrote it up and I represented him and got him out of jail. But it's been cases like that that I've seen over and over again throughout my career that helped me to understand and formulate these policies that locking people up is not what's keeping us safe. And we need someone with a new vision for what justice, equity, and public safety can look like here in Manhattan. Thank you all. And thank you, Chantal, for the question. Thank you for being here. We'll move on now to our second question from a Hunter College student, Emmanuel Zbita. Emmanuel, if you could pop on, there you are. Thank you. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself, ask your question, and I'll remind the candidates you've got a minute 30 for this one. And we'll begin with Diana Florence. So you can just begin um, after he's done answering his question, uh, asking his question. Go ahead, Emmanuel. Yeah, so first I'd like to thank Roosevelt House for the privilege of participating in this event. I'm an activist and Macaulay Honor Scholar studying political science, public policy, and human rights with an emphasis on neurodiversity representation and mental health advocacy. My question is, the special narcotics prosecutor is a remnant of the war on drugs era and an office that champions the persecution of the mentally ill and the sick. If elected, will you withdraw all of the Manhattan assistant DAs assigned to staff the SMP's office? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that the war on drugs, you know, very much was wrong headed. But I also will say that I don't believe that we should be withdrawing from the special narcotics prosecutor. I think that the special narcotics prosecutor should evolve. And we know there is an opioid crisis. You know, right now I'm in the midst of the, um, the empire of pain um, bestseller right now, talking about the sack their family, talking about what corporations, Big Pharma did to perpetuate something that has generations of consequences. So to me, what the special narcotics prosecutor must do is change with the times, just as the Manhattan District Attorney's Office must do. We need to be looking at crime as it's happening. So that means that the crime on the corner isn't simply the corner anymore. It means that we need to be looking at cyber crimes. We need to be looking at the cases 
spaces that are 21st century. And we have the tools, we have the ability. Special narcotics needs to make sure that we go after those pill mills, that we go after those corporate actors that have lined their pockets at the expense of generations of New Yorkers. I have the deep experience of doing that. I understand corporate corruption. I understand complex cases. And under my leadership, I will make sure that the special narcotics prosecutor is not a relic of the 80s, but is a true 21st century partner in making sure that the harms that they've caused uh, are now, uh, you know, are, are now rectified and prosecuted accordingly. Thank you very much. Mr. Alvin Bragg, we'll go to you and then um, Tahani Abushi will be after Mr. Bragg. Go ahead. Uh, I support abolishing the uh, special narcotics prosecutor. Um, you know, of those early experiences, you know, one of them, I was falsely accused of being a drug dealer. The sort of cases of the of the 80s, which are still being done, uh, which uh, criminalize uh, drug addiction, uh, should be a remnant of the past uh, and will not be done on my watch. Uh, and to all those who s talk about the special narcotics prosecutor doing high value uh, trafficking cases, I can lead those in the in the district attorney's office. I've done that. I've done the, mo the most sophisticated money laundering case uh, in this area uh, for someone who was the money person for the Sinaloa cartel, laundering millions of dollars of drug money. That's an important case, but I know how to do it. I prosecuted a, a pharmacy owner who was preying on those who were addicted to op opioids. We can do that within the DA's office. Uh, and to Ms. Florence's point, I completely agree about the opioid crisis. Uh, when I was chief deputy at the attorney general's office, we brought the case that's currently pending uh, against uh, the manufacturers of op opioids for this their deceptive advertising, which has led to so much addiction. Uh, I can lead that kind of case from the DA's office as well. Thanks so much for the question. Okay, thank you. Ms. Obushi, go ahead. Manuel, I think this is a great question because a lot of times, and we've done a lot of these forums, people say everybody sounds the same, everybody sounds good, says great things, but your question is going to give you a bright line uh, view of who stands where, who's going to come into this office and lead it into a new era uh, overhaul it, do the right thing for people of color, get these uh, <clears throat> offices off our backs so that our communities can thrive and grow. And who's gonna tell you they're too afraid in so many words. I'm going to withdraw all of our ADAs from that office. And I'm going to advocate for the abolishment of that office as well. When we talk about the war on drugs, we know that they came into communities of color under false pretenses and tore those families apart. And when we talk about how we're going to fix it, everybody always says, look, there's going to be truckloads of drugs coming in everywhere. It's going to be these crazy drug dealers just like running the city rampant. But let's look at who is actually being prosecuted in these offices and where the burden actually falls. And it falls on people who are suffering from substance abuse disorder. When we talk about the opioid crisis. Is that the job of a prosecutor? to alleviate the opioid crisis? Or is this a public health issue that needs public health solutions? And so that's what the, the root of your question is. We can do better and we have to wean people off of the over-reliance on policing and prosecuting as the answer for everything. Thank you. Assembly Member Court, uh, you are next with this question from Emmanuel, which is, will you withdraw all staff assigned to the S&P Excellent question, Emmanuel. Um, I support legislation at the state level to repeal the SNP law that allows for it to exist in the first place in the interim, as that's unlikely to pass this year. Oh. My apologies. Uh, I'm at an outdoor venue, um, and they're driving very fast. Um, I, I would begin the transition of the 57 attorneys on loan to the SNP office. And the reason why is to bring synergy uh, within uh, the elements of the district attorney's office because drug cases are handled in three different ways within the office depending on which trial bureau it gets into whether the violent crimes uh, department of the da's office or whether it's siphoned off to bridget brennan's special narcotics unit so a similarly situated case could be handled three different ways within manhattan that's unjust and will lead to inequ inequ inequitable outcomes and that is one of the reasons of many well, I'll begin the transition of the 57 attorneys back to the DA's office. Thank you very much. Okay, so the four remaining candidates in order, I'll just give it to you now, is Lucy Lang, you'll be next, Talia Farhadi and Weinstein after that, Eliza Orlins, and finally Liz Crotty, so you know. Go ahead, Lucy. 
Emmanuel, you're exactly right that the SNP as it has been configured is a vestige of an era that has decimated communities of color. I believe in a public health approach to substance misuse and am invested in declining to prosecute uh, possession for personal use and to partnering with public health agencies to ensure that people have pathways into the services that they need. Um, I'm also committed to, as part of my retroactive review unit, uh, employing a strategy to expunge people's records and seal records where people have convictions for matters that are no longer being prosecuted. However, you may know that New York City is the only city in the country that has five distinct district attorneys. And the, the special narcotics prosecutor is designed to enable the fact that our city, uh, it, it, rather that, that drug trafficking doesn't abide by the boundaries of boroughs. And so as a result, the special narcotics prosecutor has the potential to investigate high level trafficking. And for every one of the five district attorney's offices to individually do that would be not just redundant, but unduly expensive. So while I do intend to decrease the number of assistant district attorneys as part of developing a public health model. I uh, also, and calling upon the, the special narcotics prosecutor to do the same. I do not advocate for the abolition of special narcotics prosecutor and would uh, instead ask them to manage just the high level trafficking matters that they are better suited to handle than the five DA's offices. Thank you. Ms. Barhadian Weinstein. Thank you, Emmanuel. You know, you asked a really hard question uh, for some of the reasons that my colleagues have already laid out. Uh, let me tell you how, how I'm thinking about it. On the one hand, of course, I would much rather that anything that has to do with the safety of the people of Manhattan is handled in my office as the elected district attorney of Manhattan. But on the other hand, I also know, uh, in part from my own experience, prosecuting large scale drug trafficking organizations that, as Lucy said, uh, it is true that uh, often the way this crime works, whether it's in pill mills or uh, distributing toxic fentanyl or toxic heroin, is that the goods might come into the Bronx and then go to another borough to be packaged and then be sold in Manhattan. And it would be very complicated to weave all of that into one prosecution. So while I work that out though, I do want to make a promise to you. And I think that this is the most important thing, which is any, assistant district attorney who belongs to the district attorney's office in Manhattan, uh, when I'm in charge, will do things consistent with our policies and our values. And I'm not interested in putting people who are going through a hard time in their life and struggling with a chemical addiction in jail. I think that they need our services and we can divert them to services. But I do want to hold accountable the people who prey on the vulnerability of others who come in in order, for example, to sell heroin or synthetic marijuana to someone who is struggling with an addiction. And whether through SNP or through the district attorney's office directly, that's who I want to hold to account. Thank you. Ms. Orleans. Emmanuel, thanks for that question. And um, thanks for asking it in such a, a straightforward way, because I don't think it's a hard question. You know, absolutely, I will withdraw the attorneys that are on loan from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to the Special Narcotics Prosecutor immediately, you know, upon my taking office. And furthermore, um, I will call for the abolishment of that office. Bridget Brennan was not duly elected. In fact, none of the district attorneys who put her there um, even still hold office or are alive for the most part. So, you know, this is something we know that the war on drugs is not a war on drugs. It's in fact a racist war on people. And Ms. Farhadian Weinstein mentioned the people who prey on folks who have substance use disorder. But I can tell you who that is because I've seen it. And that is the, some of the narcotics teams, the buy and bust teams of police officers who pretend to be dope sick and approach the people who I've represented as a public defender and say, please help me out, help me out, ask for one pill of their own Xanax prescription or some of their methadone or some of their stash of illegal drugs for the for the time being. Um, and then they charge that person with sale of a narcotic to an undercover police officer. That is not keeping us safe. That is not dealing with the public health crisis of substance use disorder. And we should not be supplying district attorneys to the special narcotics prosecutor, period. And thank you for that question. Thank you. Lastly, Ms. Crotty. You're muted. 
now it's a forum. I've muted myself. <laughs> Do it every time. Um, you know, thanks, Emmanuel, for that question. I really appreciate it. I am in favor of the special narcotics prosecutor. There is approximately 383 overdoses every five hours here in Manhattan. Uh, the special narcotics prosecutor has seized over 270 pounds worth of drugs since the beginning of this year, not to mention guns that they've also gotten off the street. I think that is a vital part of what they do. I think Bridget Brennan works very hard to keep help keep New York uh, and the five boroughs safe. So I think that that is what the special narcotics d prosecutor does. I, you know, for your, for our own educational purposes, the special narcotics prosecutor does not do misdemeanor arrests and misdemeanor arrests are generally, uh, or misdemeanor cases, which are generally personal use cases. Um, and so I think that the, the role of the special narcotics prosecutor is vital as someone who has responded to the scenes of someone uh, having recently overdosed on fentanyl because they had bought fentanyl with bad cocaine and seeing firsthand what fentanyl can do to people. I think the more fentanyl and cocaine we can keep off the streets, the safer we're gonna be. And the special narcotics prosecutor is vital to that role. Thanks. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you so much for the question. We're gonna move on to question three from another student from Hunter College, Devashish Bosnet, if you could come on screen. Hey there. Um, so please introduce yourself, ask your question. We will begin with Mr. Bragg um, and you have a minute 30 for this one. So you can begin right after Devashish introduces and asks his question. Go ahead. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining uh, Roosevelt House and Hunter College students tonight. Um, so my name is David Shish Bassnet. I'm a current junior at Hunter College, majoring in political science and minoring in public policy and human rights. Um, so the Manhattan District Attorney, current uh, Cyrus Vance Jr., established an asset forfeiture fund with hundreds of millions of dollars that will be at the disposal of the next Manhattan District Attorney. How do you plan to meaningfully utilize this fund? And how will you use this and other tools and resources at your disposal to construct your vision of public safety in New York City, in Manhattan, sorry. You're muted. Now I've joined you, Liz, uh, <laughs> oh, to the party. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, uh, for your question. Um, and this is this, 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 this pot of money, first, the first issue with it, I will say, is it's opaque uh, and also dwindling. So it can't be the answer to all of our budgeting issues, uh, but it's an important a piece of the puzzle. Uh, I have my own priorities, which I'll tell you in a moment, but central to what I wanna do is have a community-based in involved process uh, so that we'll have input uh, because you know the, the, the district attorney is not uh, voted into office to do appropriations. Uh, in terms of my own priorities, which I would su submit to folks to vote on and weigh in on, uh, the top two are, are reentry and mental health. Uh, reentry programs uh, are very important to me. I had a, a loved one who was incarcerated uh, and then live with me for a year plus after, after he got out. Uh, and I saw firsthand the challenges that I knew um, from, from, from professional work. Uh, the, the lack of supports, the system didn't care that he'd witnessed the murder of his best friend. System didn't care about the solitary confinement imposed upon him. And it certainly didn't care about and make any arrangement for his housing uh, and, and, and for uh, employment opportunities. I worked on this at the attorney general's office and so have measures to put in place to support those coming home. I'm running out of time, but mental health is the second one uh, that I would invest in. We've got current programs, want to invest in them, and the government should not supplant them, but should partner with them uh, to address these two issues. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Abushi, same question to you about the forfeiture fund. How would you use it? Um, I would establish an advisory council made up of impacted community members, public health professionals, formerly incarcerated, um, civil rights defense attorneys, those who are on the front lines of addressing root causes of crime and helping us to focus on rehabilitation and preventing recidivism uh, and ensure that these programs and organizations have real measurements of success. And that's, what, that's who would be deciding where this money goes. In terms of how we use civil forfeiture asset, uh, civil asset forfeiture, we would only restrict it or limit it to white collar crime type cases. And so these are fruitful in terms of settlements. Um, uh, heavy financial crimes will help to refill this coffer and ensure that we can continue to support the programs. 
for me, something that's very important are alternative to incarceration programs and removing obstacles for diversion programs. And so when we talk about second chances, especially for those who are coming into contact with the system for the first time in their life, this is an opportunity to correct course. And we need to ensure they have the resources to actually correct course. And then for diversion programs, we have to ensure we remove all restrictions and barriers. That means making sure they're free, making sure they're confidential and accessible, making sure people are not penalized for that struggle and making sure that we're providing all the resources possible to get people on their feet. Because that's what public safety is, it's public stability and we have to have a long-term goal for that. Thank you. Assemblymember Court, same question to you. Uh, there is and will be less money in the forfeiture fund pot because of the actions I took in the legislature uh, on writing legislation and supporting budget language that limited Cy Vance's ability to monetize prosecutions rather than holding corporate malfeasance accountable. And I've talked about this often. After the crash um, that the banks caused in 2008 and 2009, Cy Vance reached deferred prosecution agreements with many banks, um, except one bank, Abacus Bank, on Canal Street in Lower Manhattan, who he deemed to prosecute in a 100 count indictment. Why? As Thomas Sung, the owner of Abacus Bank, will tell you, because he had no money to give to Cy Vance. This is an untoward pot of money. It, it is the job of the district attorney to hold people accountable in a courtroom. It is not their job to take people's money as a primary focus. That's what the change will be. And I am not looking to expand or monetize prosecutions. I am not looking to create a large discretionary pot. There are many other offices one can run for in municipal or state government to do that. Um, I serve in a body where that happens. The district attorney's office should be about achieving justice and that requires holding white collar criminal conduct accountable, not focusing specifically or exclusively on how much money you can bring into your office. Thank you. Lucy Lang, you have a minute and 30 seconds. Thank you, Devashish. That money is almost entirely gone and the next district attorney is unlikely to inherit, virtu inherit virtually any asset forfeiture money, but is going to inherit an office of 500 lawyers and 800 non-legal staff uh, who need to bring the system into the next generation. Realistically speaking, it is very unlikely that there will ever be that kind of asset forfeiture windfall again because of a change in the law and some peculiarities of, of the cases that resulted in them. So we have to think about what to do with the resources that the district attorney's office already has and the incredible resources that already exist in our communities. I have set forth in a comprehensive policy book uh, 27 plans for how I intend to reform the district attorney's office and they're available on my website. But amongst those, uh, the, the guiding uh, features of those plans are a community engagement. And that doesn't require asset forfeiture money to bring together an advisory council of directly impacted community members. I am fortunate to have just such an advisory council to my campaign as we speak, who helped inform the policies that I have drafted and committed to. And I've set forth those policies so they can serve as a report card so that you can all hold me accountable for the promises I make to you now, once I am your district attorney. Thank you very much. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, you can go ahead. Thank you, Devashish. And look, I do think it is just for the district attorney to collect the proceeds of crime and to distribute them back out into the community in order to prevent crime. I think it's uh, curious that some of my colleagues are both against collecting the money and uh, have uh, ideas about how they want to spend the money. Let me tell you, for me, uh, my thesis for how I intend to spend this kind of money is very simple. I want to use the money to put us out of business. To, do, to support the uh, community organizations that are doing the work to make communities healthier and safer, uh, to prevent crime from happening in the first place, whether that's people who work on interrupting gun violence or you know, just to give you a random example, we know in the domestic violence space that if you do education and programming for teens, when they're first you know, getting into romantic relationships, that can go a long way to preventing violence later in their lives. I think we also have to have good process. So my commitments are to make sure that the way we spend the money is transparent. Uh, right now, uh, it is not entirely transparent. Th that it is participatory, that there is a meaningful way for communities to weigh in because 
Obviously, this is the people's money. And then as in everything else, Devashish, we have to hold ourselves to account. So we have to measure are the things that we're spending money on working? Uh, if not, should we be putting the money somewhere else? And to constantly course correct with that information. Thank you very much. Eliza Orleans, you got minute 30. Devashish, thanks for that question. And I think, you know, of course, I, I echo the, the sentiments of my colleagues, you know, people saying that it should be participatory. It should, that it should be going into alternatives to incarceration. It should, that it should be, you know, reinvested in the communities, that it should be being used to prevent crime. Yes, all of those things. But I think what you need to, to think about when you're addressing these issues and, and the ways in which the candidates are talking about these things is you know, ending the practice of asset forfeiture when it comes to low level offenses. So, you know, there are people on this, on this Zoom, on this stage in my, you know, among my opponents who would in fact continue prosecuting low level drug sales. And that means, you know, people like the people I described in my last answer, you know, a client who is suffering from a substance use disorder. And maybe that person had $200 in their pocket because they don't have a bank account because they are saving that money up to pay their rent. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office takes that money, seizes that money and, and puts it as asset forfeiture and will not allow people to, to get that money back when they're being prosecuted. Asset forfeiture in a lot of ways, and we're not talking about the big white collar cases, I'm talking about these smaller cases, is theft. And it's theft from the communities who are most disparately impacted by our criminal legal system. That's black and brown people, LGBTQIA folks, people with disabilities, you know, people who are lower income. And that is something that we need to make sure our next district attorney is committed to stopping. Thank you. Liz Crotty, you are Yeah, next. thanks, Devashish, that's a good question. Um, you know, the reason the district attorney had the large amount of money that it had was because there was a $8.9 billion settlement of a sanction uh, of BMP Bank that was initiated by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office where they got that large windfall. Uh, when I was at the DA's office, I worked on a investigation into the oil for food case where Saddam Hussein was violating the sanctions program. That's precisely why I went to this office. Um, I think that white collar crime and really big investigations like this that generate this kind of money are precisely what the DA should be doing, should be doing often and really getting the money despite what Mr. Court's done in the legislature to really invest back into the community. And, and we've seen the benefit of that with Mr. Vance's initiatives that he had. I think the initiatives have to be fairer and more equally placed out and have you know, it seems to be there was a little bit of an inside baseball into which programs got got it. And I think we have to be the most responsive to the program because we need to have help. You know, public safety is a group effort and it's a group effort of the communities of where the people who live there who feel the effects of crime. Investing in those communities heavily so that crime goes down is part of public safety and what we should be doing. And the very way we do it is by the white collar cases that I went there to prosecute. Thank you very much. And lastly, we'll hear from Diana Florence. Yes, thank you. So as the only one who did these cases on a state level and brought in millions of dollars um, from white collar companies that violated the law, the way I would use asset forfeiture is the same way I did as a prosecutor. And that means reinvesting it back into programs that really affect Manhattan. So that meant anywhere from, for example, a company that violated minority and women owned business laws, um, reinvesting that money into training and helping companies, small companies become big companies, because that in fact is the point, right? We want Manhattan to benefit from the money that has been stolen from us. Second, we need to be thinking about mental health and kids. When we think about the gun epidemic that is happening in our city, the shootings that are happening, they're not happening a suddenly sua sponte to 20 year olds. This is a problem that dates back to when kids are finishing elementary school. If we can get kids on a different path, we can help that, we can use that money. For example, I have a plan where we will invest not in coding classes, but not just classes because those are, those are fine, but if they lead to nothing, it doesn't do anything. But then we connect it to an internship program that will allow those same kids every 
summer to work in the IT departments of the multitude of city agencies and private sectors. We can do that. We can reinvest money that will really make us safer and prevent crimes for generations to come. Thank you so much. Devashish, thank you so, so much for being here and for your question. Okay, we're gonna move on to our fourth question from a student, Michelle Gomez. Welcome, you could pop onto the screen. There you are. Um, so- Hi, good evening. So go ahead and introduce yourself, ask your question. We will begin with Tahani Abushi after you're done. All right, go ahead. Again, thank you for being here this evening. I'm honored to be here as well. My name is Michelle Gomez and I am a senior at Hunter College in Urban Studies and Public Policy. My question this evening regards NYCHA. I am a NYCHA resident as well. Criminal charges have never been filed against the NYCHA managers or any other NYCHA officials involved in multiple fraud cases. False signature schemes regarding lead abatement and many other tenant health violations still exist present day. Do you believe NYCHA officials should be held accountable in criminal court for their actions and for that matter, should landlords face criminal charges for allowing health violations to fester in their rental units? Thank you. Michelle, thank you so much for that question. You know, I am the only candidate who has been endorsed by NYCHA resident council presidents, seven to date. Uh, and I had this exact conversation on Tuesday of this week uh, with the residents of Jacob Reese houses on the Lower East Side. Um, so to your question in terms of corruption, absolutely. I've always committed to putting no badge or bank account above the law. And we will root out corruption wherever we see it, especially when it threatens the livelihood, the safety, and the quality of life um, of people, especially uh, NYCHA tenants. In terms of landlords, I think for me, my entire platform is decarceral, and I really do want to wean us off of using prosecution as that knee-jerk reaction for these issues. What we need to do is center the voices of the tenants and understand how is our reaction going to ensure that habitability, to ensure that you are not harassed and kicked out of your apartment, to ensure that landlords are not continuing to have the benefits of being landlords, whether it's renting out apartments, using the programs, um, being paid through any of our, our um, subsidies uh, through the government um, and losing their privileges. Um, and we can do that without relying on criminal prosecutions. The other reason why I think we have to be careful about criminal prosecutions is because when you talk about who's doing the work for the landlord, these are the low hanging fruits. And it's often people of colors, often supers who are put on the hook for the actions of these really big corporations and the landlords that abuse their power. So with the investigatory power and the subpoena power that our office has, we can get to the root causes of these issues and work with tenants to focus on solutions that helps them as well. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Assembly Member Court. I know you have to leave in just a few minutes, so feel free to answer Michelle's question and then um, a quick closing statement and um, you can leave whenever you need to. I'll try and stay on for a little longer if, uh, if that's okay. Um, I I've canvassed in so many NYCHA complexes, have the support of many NYCHA tenant leaders, resident association leaders, but to specific of your question, um, I will certainly prosecute uh, any act of extortion or fraud um, perpetrated by anyone at night just stealing the public's money. But I wanna just go a little broader in one of the biggest problems that exist in NYCHA housing um, that really involves the criminal legal system and its failures. And this is the intersection of city government, federal government and the DA's office. And that's the complete inability of NYCHA to move tenants to different complexes when their public safety is threatened. Um, with uh, the terrible situation of Taylon Murphy uh, who went through the worst thing that any parent could happen was that his daughter uh, was murdered in violence at the Grant Houses on uh, West, uh, West 120s. It took NYCHA 13 to 14 months to move his family out of that complex where he was still a target of violence after his own daughter was murdered. This is the failures of NYCHA. It goes well beyond fraud and extortion. That exists and it'll be prosecuted but it is the failure of government and NYCHA to resolve these basic issues that concern people's public safety in NYCHA. That's what I think as a legislator, as someone who's ensconced in city and state government, where I will be most effective in making these changes that go well beyond the courtroom that will improve people's quality of life and ensure a higher level of public safety for people in NYCHA as NYCHA residents. 
and I hope I can stay on for the next question. Oh, sure, yeah, feel free to stay on. Um, <laughs> our next uh, candidate is Lucy Lang. You can go ahead a minute and 30 seconds for you. Thank you, Michelle, and, and congratulations on your upcoming graduation. I handled a case many years ago in which uh, anonymous tenants of a housing complex sent a letter to the district attorney complaining of the fact that there had been a murder on their playground related to the fact that there was major narcotics trafficking uh, through the complex. I ran a team of detectives undercovers and ultimately we were able to work our way up the chain and identify uh, two brothers who did not live in the community who were moving hundreds of thousands of dollars of fencyclidine a week through this complex and using children as young as eight years old to act as lookouts. Ultimately, a grand jury indicted them for their role in trafficking and for the conspiracy. And when they were arrested, the Tenants Association literally danced in the street. But when I went to meet with them afterwards, they said, uh, what now? And I said to them, what do you mean? And they said, well, what about the broken lights and doorknobs that, that they broke to protect their, their trafficking? What about the fact that our playground is overrun with rats and in disrepair? And so working alongside the Tenants Association, I brought together the New York City Parks Department, NYCHA, local businesses and others to begin to work to revitalize the community. And that's the kind of leadership I intend to exercise as district attorney. I've set forth a plan for tenants rights on my website, including establishing a tenancy unit at the district attorney's office and an interagency task force to undertake the kind of efforts I just described. Thank you very much. I'm gonna read the question one more time just so we can all remind ourselves what it is and the participants um, who are watching know what it is and we don't get lost. And then um, Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, you will answer. Um, Michelle's question was, do you believe NYCHA officials should be held accountable in criminal court for their actions? Um, and also should landlord, landlords face criminal charges for allowing health violations to fester in rental units? Michelle, uh, you asked uh, about two kinds of criminal cases that we might be able to bring uh, and that I'm really committed to because I think this is public safety at its core. First of all, uh, public corruption, uh, if what you describe is corrupt, you know, I was a public corruption prosecutor when I was a federal prosecutor and uh, it was so meaningful for me to go after institutions that are here to serve in which graft and cheating and backroom deals, and bribery, wind up ultimately stealing from the people who are supposed to benefit and stealing from all of us. I brought, for example, a, a long-term investigation and prosecution against uh, a bribery scheme at Con Ed, uh, where um, there, there were bribes that were being made to various managers at Con Ed uh, in order to get, uh, to get favorable contracts, to get first in line. Uh, and ultimately, the work that was delivered to people was at a higher cost uh, and not of the same quality. But you're also asking about environmental justice. You know, I was at uh, St. Nicholas Houses just last week with Congressman Richie Torres to talk about this. Uh, my mentor, Eric Holder, was the first one to teach me that environmental justice is racial justice, is justice. Uh, when people's criminal acts result in the breathing quality being different, kids eating lead paint, uh, you know, just taking away people's basic right uh, to have safety in their environment. We are supposed to come in. Uh, and that's why I'm going to have a robust environmental crimes unit at the DA's office. Thank you very much. Eliza Orlin, same question to you. Uh, yes. So, um, Michelle, thank you for that question. And it's a really important one because I think that for, for far too long, public safety has been so narrowly defined and it hasn't included people's you know, built environments. And so I've seen how so many of the people I've represented um, throughout my years as a public defender have been have experienced these environmental hazards that you're talking about in NYCHA housing, you know, whether it be toxic mold or lead paint or, um, you know, air quality issues. These are things that I've seen my clients experience. And so this also, you know, disproportionately affects the same people that the over prosecution of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office affects. And so it's really important that we have a district attorney who is committed to holding people accountable. And that doesn't necessarily mean, 
using jail and prison um, reflexively, but it really means taking these things seriously, which is why I've laid out plans for an environmental justice unit and why I'm committed to holding landlords accountable, especially when there are false certifications being filed, when things are occurring that are hurting New Yorkers. Because I've, as a public defender, have always stood up for New Yorkers, and that is exactly what I will continue to do as district attorney. Thank you very much. Liz Crotty, you can go ahead. Thanks so much. You know, just the other day I was um, reading uh, the news and my old paralegal, who's now at the Brooklyn DA's office, uh, had a big case in Brooklyn on NYCHA. And I called him up and I said, good job, because that is really what public safety is about, is as we've all discussed, is everyone having a safe place to live. I think that we need to have a robust public corruption uh, department. And I think that looks at these cases and partners with DOI, the Department of Investigations, which is the New York City Department of Ed in, in, ah investigations, which is precisely what we, we did when I was there. You partner with other city, city agencies to hold NYCHA and the wrongdoings in NYCHA accountable because everyone should have a safe place to live and that is inside and outside of the home. Um, you know, I think that that's part of what we're, we'll be looking at with DOI and in the investigative unit is looking at all things that come to, to the DA's office. But I also think too, there has to be, and I've talked about this before, an intake bureau uh, where people can bring their investigations directly to the DA's office. And this means there will be a way where the district attorney's office has to be much more interfacing with the public. I think we've all been out here um, campaigning and it's surprising how much the public does not know what the district attorney's office can do. And I think the next district attorney, that being me, but has to really be more interfacing with the public so people who are tenants know, hey, this guy is doing something criminal and I'm going to bring an investigation, a potential investigation to the district attorney's office. Thanks. Thank you. Diana Florence, a minute and 30 for Michelle's question. Thank you. You know, Michelle, let's just call it the way it is. Housing fraud has prospered because it's lived in the housing courts and the housing world. And I'm the one of, in this race and frankly in the district attorney's office who tried to bridge that into the criminal world. I did the NYCHA case. I didn't have a paralegal do it. I did it myself. In Back in December of 19, I prosecuted a, a company that defrauded NYCHA residents by faking repairs. And that was going to be the beginning of a bigger case, but I didn't have the resources to do that. I also tried to go after landlords because I understand that housing fraud exists. And it doesn't exist because it's happenstance or just, uh, just came out of nowhere. It, it is a calculation oh, by certain me. corrupt right. landlords who have actually seen that there is no enforcement and therefore they know that they can play the odds. I have a plan to change that. I announced it almost immediately when I started my candidacy. And that is about making sure that anyone who has any fraud, who has any fraud um, is going to be able to report it to us. And we are going to proactively look. We don't have to wait. We can actually look at the court records and bring those cases proactively. I understand that it is a shame. It is absolutely a tragedy that the only thing that happened when those lead paint poisonings happened was a DOI, DOI report. That must change and it will change when I'm DA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lastly, we'll hear from Alvin Bragg. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. You know, I've, I've lived in neighborhoods my entire life that have been deeply beset by the kind of environmental issues that others have talked about and that animate your question. I remember when the asthma rate skyrocketed when I was in high school uh, in Harlem. Uh, that's probably what drove me to focus on these kind of cases uh, during my career. Uh, I've done lead abatement cases, both criminal and civil, looking at where the facts take us. Uh, important environmental uh, cases, false filing cases, and also you know, doing the abatement to actually get the lead out. Uh, I've also uh, done landlord cases, uh, both uh, criminally and civilly, uh, focusing on landlords who harass tenants out of their homes, uh, focusing, on, focusing on landlords who have uh, tenants living in substandard conditions. So I've done the very work that you talk about. Uh, the same is also true for the public corruption angle. Uh, I have uh, prosecuted uh, the, the, the majority leader of the state Senate, a council member and a mayor for bribery. So I know how to build those cases and I don't shy away from bringing them up with people who sit in the seat of power. 
and procurement fraud. You're right. We need to look at the vendors who are, who are supposed to be doing certain things, our government money, our taxpayer money going to, to uh, uh, certain government programs. I've done those cases too, procurement fraud cases involving uh, bridging the digital divide. Uh, I prosecuted someone who was supposed to be doing that, but instead was stealing millions of dollars. Uh, so I know that type of work. I know how to do it. And I care deeply because uh, I've experienced it personally. Thank you very much. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that great question. I love NYCHA questions. There should be more of them at every forum for every uh, race, in my opinion. Um, so we're gonna take questions now from our audience and we've gotten some really good ones. Um, the first one that we have is from Sandy Cooper. It's about the Trump investigation. She asks, actually, I, I'm not sure if it's she or he, but Sandy asks, how do you plan to pursue the Trump cases that Cy Vance has launched? Um, and I'm just going to complicate that a bit and ask, you know, this is as big as an investigation gets, as high profile as it gets. So many eyes are on this case. Um, so I would like to ask, what skills or experience will you bring to this to shepherd forward such a high profile and complicated case? So we'll begin with assembly member court, and this will be 60 seconds for this question, a little bit shorter. Thank you so much. And thank you to my colleagues and the listeners. I, I have to sign off after this question. I think all of us as candidates have uh, agreed not to comment specifically on uh, the theoretical case against the former president. But for 23 years, I've been a practicing attorney, complex civil litigation, uh, the management of different associates, criminal defense work as well, and significant reform in the legislature. I certainly have uh, the skills, the background and experience um, if this case becomes a real reality. But I think it's important to note, we only have one district attorney at a time. And right now it's Mr. Vance. We have to allow him and his team to make a determination on this case without the eight of us um, opining in a way that would uh, uh, adversely affect anything he might do. Um, just to briefly close, because I don't want to take uh, too much time, I wanted to thank everyone. Um, uh, my good friend, a New York City icon um, and uh, a great historian of this city, Harold Holzer, who is on this line, uh, Zoom tonight. Um, uh, sign my book, his latest book about Abraham Lincoln, always uh, the long and short of it. Uh, the long being Abraham Lincoln, me at 5'8 being the short of it. Um, to me, the long and short of this campaign is who is best equipped to bring about the reform of this office that is so desperately needed. And uh, I hope some of my answers today, my experience in the legislature, and 23 years of practicing law uh, convinces those that I'm the right person. Um, thank you so much for uh, allowing me uh, to speak tonight and uh, to my colleagues, uh, I pass it back to you and uh, have a good night, Hunter. Thank you for being here. Okay, uh, next we will go to Lucy Lang. Same question, and I know that you all cannot speak um, about the case specifically, obviously, but um, how would you handle such a high profile and complicated investigation? From the first day I launched this campaign, I set forth an equal access policy that de describes that there will be no special backroom meetings between well-heeled uh, attorneys and myself and senior staff under my administration that needs to stop. So that's one way. I also have experienced handling some of the most complex and serious cases and know the importance of the continuity of a team. And I'm committed to continuing the important work on all of the ongoing investigations that I uh, oversee when I take over as district attorney. It's important also to note that the vast, vast majority of cases that the district attorney's office handles are not uh, of that nature. And in fact, the vast, vast majority of of even economic crimes are not of that nature. They're the kind of economic crimes that affect everyday New Yorkers like identity theft and cybercrime. And I have handled those cases day in and day out and understand the workings of the criminal justice system better than anyone else in this field. Beyond that, the work of reform must also not be sacrificed by the attention given to any one investigation. And I'm committed to doing that work. Thank you very much. Tali Farhadi and Weinstein, same question to you about how you would handle the Trump investigation hypothetically. Mm. You know, when I think when voters are focusing on this and trying to say, well, who is the person who is the most capable, has the expertise, the temperament, the judgment to handle a case 
as sophisticated and complex as this one, uh, I don't think it's about saying, well, okay, who has prosecuted some white collar cases? I've prosecuted many white collar cases, or who has done tax evasion as I have, uh, or even who has sued the Trump administration uh, as I have, and I won on behalf of the Brooklyn DA. To me, the more important thing is, who has proven in the course of her career that she can handle unprecedented questions, the hardest questions uh, to which we don't know the answers yet uh, and that have national dimensions and national eyes on us. And this is really where I draw on all of my experiences, you know, when I was working for the Attorney General of the United States, uh, dealing with things as complex as Guantanamo Bay to uh, the role of states in immigration enforcement, all the way to the Brooklyn DA's office, where we really tried to change the face of local prosecution. Uh, and it's really about having those qualities uh, more than being able to connect to one or the other dot into a particular investigation that I think should be on voters' minds, given how much is at stake. Thank you very much. Eliza, same question to you. What experience do you have? How would you shepherd forward such a high profile case as the Trump investigation? So as the only public defender in this race, I have handled over 3000 cases, but as a public defender, I sometimes have as many as 180 cases at any given time. And that means for every case, I've got teams of investigators, social workers, expert witnesses, paralegals, making strategic decisions all while people's lives are at stake. Sometimes media attention on these cases, having to you know, really make sure that I am keeping everything in the air while protecting someone's liberty. Um, this is something that is so critical because, you know, people talk about the, the way in which, oh, you know, you have to have had prosecutorial experience, but that hasn't gotten us to exactly where we are. And, you know, Cy Vance notoriously did not bring the prosecution against the Trumps back in 2013, dropped that case after receiving, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands in terms of bundling from Mark Kasowitz, the Trump's attorney. And, you know, it really takes the political will, the, the, the understanding of what is at stake for someone to bring about these prosecutions, someone who has always stood up to power, which is exactly what I've done as a public defender, and not just making these decisions when the wind blows in a certain way and it becomes politically popular to do so. Thank you very much. Liz Crotty, same question to you. Yeah, I think, it, you know, the district attorney's office comes down to judgment and who has a deep bench of judgment and what is their critical thinking and what is their resume. Um, I have, you know, complex white collar crimes under my uh, and, and investigations under my belt, as I did with Saddam Hussein in the oil for food program. I also worked uh, for two years at a firm on the 9-11 terror funding case, which is a civil case, but it was multi-level international case. But we don't know what's happening with the Trump case, as we, we've all discussed. We don't know the facts. Um, I think that the Mr. Vance has assembled a very uh, capable and smart team, as reported in the newspaper. And I think, you know, we are going to, whoever becomes the next DA, will be inheriting thousands of indictments on January 1st, 2022. And if that is one of them, that is just one of the many that we will do. I think inviting the trial team to stay, continue what they started, and really let them do the investigation that they started and let the district attorney you know, oversee it, but we're going to keep doing what we need to do to keep New York safe. Thank you very much. Diana Florence. Go I'm ahead. gonna disagree with some of my colleagues here. I do think experience matters. I am the only one in this race that has prosecuted complex corruption in the very office where the Trump case lives, in the very industry where Trump made his name construction and real estate. I understand how to build these cases from the ground up. I understand that in 2013, the tragedy was not whether or not, the real tragedy was not whether or not he brought that specific case, is that they stopped there. Because I understand corruption cases, they start very differently from the way they end. And a quick story, I did one of the most uh, important cases involving construction fraud uh, in the rebuilding of the World Trade Center. And that case started with a big company trying to scapegoat a formerly incarcerated inspector for the falsifications. It led to not only that company and those executives being convicted of racketeering, but an industry-wide crackdown and changes to the building code. I have that experience. I won't interfere with the investigation and the, the talent 
talented people who are taking it over and we're working on it now, but I understand I can take the lead and make sure that this investigation is full and complete and the public can trust in what we have. Thank you. Alvin Bragg, you're next. I think there are two key skill sets for a case of this nature. Uh, the first is management. So, you know, I, I oversaw the attorney general's office as the number two lawyer. Uh, and in so doing, drove and directed uh, cases uh, like this, cases uh, that are high profile and quite consequential, some of them involving Trump himself. So leading the team uh, that uh, held accountable Trump and his kids for their misconduct with the Trump Foundation, or leading the team that uh, sued Harvey Weinstein and his business for having a hostile work environment. So I think knowing how to manage, and I also want to note, knowing to pull together a team. So it's not an office of one, right? You got you to gotta know how to pull and manage and put people in the places uh, to succeed and use their core skill sets. And the second is, I do think it matters who's done these types of cases before. So I've done money laundering, I've done tax fraud, I've done cases involving shell companies. I don't know exactly what's involved in this matter, but I think someone who's handled those kind of complex matters, uh, including public corruption, I mentioned some of that earlier. I do think that's important. Thank you very much. Tahani, go ahead. I think, you know, the concern with Trump is that he represents some of the powerful and privileged people that have been able to essentially do whatever they want with impunity. And the district attorney's office of Manhattan has become synonymous with that kind of leniency. And so one, what we need to do is first and foremost, be independent and not buckle under the pressure to look the other way. And everybody here knows that once you're district attorney, you're not going to be trying cases you're going to assemble that team that will try cases um, and will inherit this uh, investigation and maybe indictment. And for me, I, I spent my entire career as a civil rights attorney building these complex civil litigation cases where you need to compile your experts, your co-counsel, understand uh, the courtroom, understand how to think like the person that you're investigating and the agencies you're investigating. And so I agree with, with Mr. Bragg that that's absolutely important. But I also think that we have to ensure independence here. And that means not interfering with that investigation and allowing the team to move forward wherever it may lead. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to another question from the audience. We actually got two questions that are on the same theme, um, which is um, prosecuting Wall Street related white collar crime. Um, and one of these questions was specifically for Ms. Tali Farhadian Weinstein about um, your husband is a hedge fund manager. You have got a lot of donations from you know, folks who are work in that profession. I know you have to leave in a few minutes. So I'll go to you first on this. Could you respond to how will you prosecute um, folks who work in that field on Wall Street, given the funding to your campaign? Um, and for everyone else, you know, generally, how would you handle um, prosecuting folks on Wall Street? But go ahead, Ms. Tolly. Sure, thank you, Rachel. Let me separate that into two parts. You know, uh, yes, of course, my husband is a hedge fund manager, uh, and I'm so proud of his successes. And I absolutely don't think it means that if somebody is in the same general field as him, that uh, I would be motivated in, in any way to treat that person differently. And I hope that's true for all of my colleagues uh, and all of the industries that they might be connected to through their family members and through their spouses. And uh, hopefully that we would all agree that we uh, are separate from our spouses uh, in our work pursuits. Uh, you know, when it comes to donors, Rachel, you know, it's interesting because everybody here has taken the same approach. Nobody drew a line uh, and said, well, I'm not going to take money from Wall Street or from people in real estate or from people in Hollywood or in oil and gas or in any other industry. And in fact, everyone here has solicited the same checks from the same people in the same rooms. Uh, one of my colleagues here is, has an independent expenditure for him that is largely funded by people who work on Wall Street. Uh, what I can tell you for myself is I have never been beholden to anybody. I have done many complex white collar cases as a federal prosecutor, uh, and I intend to carry on in the same way that my career has always been defined by holding everybody accountable under the law, no matter who they are, what office they occupy, uh, what uniform they wear, uh, and what kind of power they might yield. Okay, thank you very much. And I know you have to leave in just a couple of minutes. Um, so thank you for being with us. Um, and you know, thank you for answering the question. Okay, um, do I, should I make a closing statement or just say yeah, goodbye? Yeah, just a quick, quick 30 seconds and then uh, we'll say goodbye. 
Okay, wonderful. And that's really all I want to say uh, is how pleased I was to be included here tonight and particularly in an institution uh, that represents the American dream. You know, uh, I am an immigrant kid myself and I know how important it is to have these institutions that create pathways for people to succeed and to thrive. And for my part, I think that if people are not safe, they cannot succeed, they cannot thrive and prosper and have the opportunities that people come here from all over the world to have. Uh, so it's really a privilege to be with you and uh, it would be a privilege to be able to continue to do this work on behalf of the people of Manhattan. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so we'll say goodbye to you and then we're going to move on uh, the same question about how you would to Lucy Lang, how you would prosecute white collar crime, crimes on Wall Street, um, and if any donations that you are getting would interfere with that work. I will reiterate the point I made in response to the previous question, which is that it is of paramount importance to me that there be no equal access, rather no, no unequal access or even the appearance of that um, to anyone, regardless of who they are who, or who their attorney is. And I have set that forth very clearly and I'm deeply committed to that. With respect to handling of economic crimes, I have um, laid out a plan for structurally changing the handling of economic crimes in the district attorney's office to integrate the major economic crimes bureau with what's now the Financial Frauds Bureau under the umbrella of an overall Financial Crimes Bureau, such that the kinds of economic crimes that affect ordinary New Yorkers get the same sort of resources that these large scale bank cases get as well and have the same level of, of legal talent because it is so important that we treat seriously the economic crimes that affect everyday New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Eliza Orleans, same question to you. That's a really important question. And, you know, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to answer it while Ms. Farhadian Weinstein was still on because I would love for her to have an opportunity to respond because I am going to talk about her by name. But I think that, you know, all of the rest of us on this uh, on this call are raising money. We are we are working very hard for the donations that we're receiving. But what she is doing is completely and utterly different than what the rest of us are doing. And, you know, anyone on this call of the 200 people still left who are Manhattan residents have probably already received a mailbox filled with at least five big glossy mailers from her, have seen her all over their televisions because she is trying to buy this seat as a career prosecutor, as someone who will be beholden to Wall Street so that she can continue to perpetuate mass incarceration of people of color. And I think that she is an extremely dangerous candidate. And I'm so glad that one of your one of the one of the viewers asked this question, because this is a huge problem that, that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has had that I've seen as a public Public defender, and that is the last thing that Manhattan needs to continue to have after this. Okay, thank you. I wish she could respond to that as well, but um, I, that's not possible. Um, Liz Crotty, same question to you um, about how you would prosecute white collar crime crimes that uh, come from Wall Street. Yeah, well, you have to go after Wall Street crimes. White collar crime, we white collar crime in all areas, banks, corporations, hedge funds. I mean, and anyone who defrauds the everyday New Yorker has to be held responsible. Um, and I think that that's incumbent upon this office to do that. Um, when it comes to fundraising in this race, you know, there are uh, candidates who have set a high bar and we're just, you know, we're trying to catch up just so we can get our names out there, as Eliza said. So, I mean, I think that we, we really have to look at what that, this all means. And I would um, amplify this by saying that after this race, the district attorney's office should really be campaign financed. Uh, I don't understand. I know it's a state race, um, but I think this is a real call for campaign finance and an equal footing because the district attorney should stay so neutral in, in every industry that we go after. We go after all different types of industries uh, and, and bad actors in every industry. So to keep our impartiality with campaign finance is the way to go. And I would assume whoever is running for re-election should really undertake that as a mantle for the next district attorney. Thank you very much. Diana Florence, same question to you in 60 seconds. Go ahead. 
Thank you. You know, of all the candidates, I am the candidate of working people. Other candidates in the race, this race, I think we've all really established Ms. Weinstein's um, funding, but there's others who have Hollywood funding, who have, you know, professional athletes. Um, they have all sorts of other industries. My funding is from everyday working people and from labor unions who represent everyday working people, people that actually pick up our kids and build them to school, build our buildings, uh, pick up our garbage. I'm really proud of that. And that's what my campaign is about. And I have worked for 25 years holding the powerful accountable, even when it was tough, even at my own self detriment. I have that deep experience prosecuting corruption, whether it's in the real estate sector, and I'm not taking real estate developer money, by the way, and I've been clear about that from the start, whether it's in construction, and I will obviously use those same skills and make sure that our office is used to proactively not wait for the cases to come to us, but proactively make sure that Wall Street, if they violate the law, they're held accountable. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna read one of the questions that came in about this, just to remind us, just to refresh, um, came from Irving Kagan. Why should we trust you to aggressively prosecute white collar crime? And that's to Alvin Bragg. You've got 60 seconds. Thanks. So you should trust me because I've done it. I've worked on uh, one of the country's largest uh, antitrust cases as a junior lawyer. Uh, in the Marsh uh, investigation that some may recall. Uh, and then this book into my career, one of the last cases I oversaw as chief deputy was a very significant securities fraud of an investment professional who was bilking funds, hard earned funds uh, from retirees. Uh, and in between, I worked on almost every type of white collar fraud you can think of, um, you know, prosecuting, as we've mentioned, some of the early landlords who harassed tenants, uh, doing wage theft cases, doing some of the public corruption cases I mentioned earlier. So. I have a 20 plus year history of going wherever the facts take me without favor. And uh, there's nothing uh, that's happened that's gonna change that. Uh, and that's why you should trust me in going forward. Just look at my record. Thank you very much. Tahani, same question to you. Yeah, I've always committed to putting no badge or bank account above the law. And for me, um, I don't come from these circles. I come from the working class, from people who are victims of these crimes. And oftentimes we don't think of Wall Street crimes as having victims, but we've seen it. We've seen it with Ponzi schemes, mortgage fraud, wage theft, extortions. Um, and the communities that I come from are the ones who bear the brunt uh, of those uh, of that criminal conduct. And so for me, um, having been fearless in the face of power in all of the complex cases that I've brought, having changed policy of agencies that refused to be transparent, that's something I'm going to continue as Manhattan District Attorney, focusing on Wall Street and white collar crimes and ensuring that they are held accountable. And one thing I wanna say, and, and Ms. Weinstein is, you know, um, we've had issues with Cy Vance and conflict of interest of defense attorneys who appeared before him. And I asked her in the New York One debate to alleviate that concern for voters, would she recuse herself for the companies that might have open investigations under her administration? And she refused. And I think that's, that's worrisome. Thank you very much. We have another question here from uh, someone in the audience named Michael Rothstein. And this is a question about um, police officers and their uh, discredited testimony. And this is actually a yes or no question. There's a, it's a two part. I'd love to just do 30 seconds for this one so we can get to another question after that. Um, so Michael asks, and I should give the order. Lucy Lang, you'll go first. Eliza, Liz Crotty, Diana Florence, Alvin Bragg, and Tahani will end as, uh, again. Um, Michael asks, do you think it's appropriate for the DA's office to refuse to use police officers as witnesses who have a history of discredited testimony? Do you think the names of such officers should be made public? Lucy? Thank you for that critically important question, Michael. I'm honored to have spent a lot of time working alongside families who lost loved ones to police violence to build my plan for police accountability. And it includes ensuring that we don't rely on the word of police officers who have been found to not be credible. So absolutely, I think that we should continue, we should discontinue that reliance. In cases where there is an affirmative finding of a police officer's misconduct or lack of credibility, that should be transparent to the public. Okay, thank you so much for the concise answer. Eliza, same question to you. 
Uh, Michael, thanks for that question. I think not only is it appropriate for the DA's office to refuse to use police officers testimony um, when they have been discredited, but it's imperative. And that's why I'm incredibly committed to holding police accountable and to making those lists public. I think they absolutely should be public to criminal defense attorneys and public defenders because I know how hard it was to find out about prior history of discredited testimony by police officers as a public defender. And I think that that needs to be public to to um, the public as well, because you have the right to know. Thanks. Thank you so much. Liz Crotty, same question to you. And I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, you know, I defended a police officer who had uh, forged a document to keep their housing. And uh, when we were, we were about to start the trial, uh, there was a, a police representative in the courtroom. And it turned out no matter what the outcome of that trial was guilty or not guilty, uh, that police officer, that police officer was going to not keep their job. So I mean, I've seen this firsthand. I think the police, you know, when I think we have to look, the police do manage this in house uh, and do fire incredible officers. Um, and I think we also have to look at what is the, um, you know. We can't use anybody who has been found guilty of misconduct and lied. But I mean, I think what is that where, you know, so I think that that's what we need to be looking at is like people who have been found guilty and discredited. And I think we have to look at the police. But I also find too sometimes it's you have to, you know, just what is the basis of the discredit discrediting too? I think that we have to give police officers due process and fair accountability before we decide not to use them at trial. Let me just clarify. So it sounds like if they have actually been found guilty of having discredited testimony, that you would not use them in the case. Is that correct? Yeah. They, yes. In and in a, if there has been a, a proper investigation and something that has been done, yes, we would not use their their testimony. And would you make their names public? You know, it, de it depends. I would make it public to the defense counsel in a case so that the defendant would always know. But I don't, you know, I don't think what I have to would decide the balance of what is the outcome to making it public to the general public versus the pub to the people who it, it really matters to in the case at hand. Okay, thank you. Diana Florence, same question to you. I'm confused by the answer because with 50A being declassified, effectively those names will be be public, and I certainly support that. If a police officer has committed um, a, you know, frankly they they've lied, that should be public. They should be disciplined, and you know, if it's within uh, the criminal law, we should prosecute them because the fact is we need police officers. We need people to trust law enforcement, and if there is a perception or a reality that police officers are getting away with crimes, whether it's violence the law by lying or abusing their power through um, brutality, um, then other police officers can't do their job. And we as prosecutors can't do our job either. So absolutely, I would um, you know, be transparent about it and I would make it public. And I'm just gonna re-ask the first part of the question, um, just in case you didn't hear that one or you wanna make it clear. Michael asked, do you think it's appropriate for the DA's office to refuse to use police officers as witnesses? Is that a yes? Okay. It's a yes, and sorry. Okay. I just wanted to know. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, yes. um, and Alvin Bragg, uh, go ahead with the same questions. Yes, to both questions. I would refuse to use police officers who have a history of discredited testimony, uh, and I would make the names public. Uh, okay. This is based upon my life and work experience. I've had police officers lie on me when I was growing up. Uh, and then as a prosecutor, I prosecuted an FBI agent for lying. And I'm currently representing uh, Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr, in a case against the city seeking transparency about uh, his death. And central to that is an officer who lied and said that no force was used in arresting Mr. Garner. We've all seen the video. We know that's a lie. He's still on the force seven years later, has not been disciplined, and I'm in court fighting for that. So these, these principles are very important to me. Okay, thank you very much. Mutani Abushi. Same question. Yeah, these are these are positions of public trust, and these decisions permanently impact uh, our families, uh, particularly communities of color. So, absolutely, the district attorney's office should be proactive in ensuring that we don't use these officers, um, and that it's not only made public, 
But two things, we work to get these officers off the force because if they did it once, I'm sure there's a pattern here. And secondly, we have to extend that to prosecutor accountability. Prosecutors, assistant district attorneys who are aware of these things going on and continue to secure these easy and sometimes false convictions. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the conciseness to everyone, um, which gives us an excuse to get to the last question. Um, several people asked about um, sex work and how this office would prosecute sex work, which gives me an excuse to ask my own question about this. Um, for those who don't know, DA Vance just announced that his office would no longer prosecute prostitution. Um, that was a request to dismiss more than 900 open cases related to prostitution and unlicensed massage and dismissal, dismissal of more than 5,000 cases of the loitering for the purposes of prostitution charge. So I want to know what your reaction is to that move by Vance and does it go far enough um, when it comes to laws relating to sex work? If not, how would you change the prosecution of sex work related crimes in the future? And we're gonna do 60 seconds for this one. And the first person will be Eliza or Linz. I am so glad that you asked that. And I think this is such an important question. We have to be talking about this. And I have been an outspoken advocate for decriminalization, full decriminalization of consensual sex work. Um, you know, I think the first time I talked publicly about it was in 2010. And to say it was an unpopular opinion then doesn't quite encapsulate just how unpopular it was. But this is an issue of racial justice, of economic justice, of LGBTQIA justice. I've seen the way in which people are harassed and stigmatized for doing their jobs by the vice squad, which we must disband, you know, by prosecutors. So while, yes, I'm glad that Cy Vance is dismissing those cases, um, and I'm glad that Danny Frost is reading my, my talking points, um, I think it doesn't nearly go far enough. We have to fully decriminalize consensual sex work, which means not prosecuting sellers or buyers so that we keep people safe, we're able to prosecute traffickers, and we can make sure that we are living in a city that is equitable and just for everyone. Thank you so much. Liz Crotty, same question to you. Sure, I don't have a do not prosecute list because I think it's incumbent upon the legislature to do these things. And the legislature just decided that walking while trans, the loitering for prostitution was unconstitutional. When it comes to sex work, I've represented people uh, who've done sex work and um, Johns. But the thing is, is that where I come down on it is like, if somebody is a human trafficking victim and they get arrested for prostitution and they get into the precinct and they say, this person is doing this to me, I do not want to be here. That has to be an avenue. It's a very slight chance. I know that that happens, but I just don't think it's upon the district attorney's office to do this. I think that we have to look at each case on a case by case basis for precisely this reason. I understand there's not much economy in going after sex work, but still that's our mandate. So that's where I come down on this. I'm also going to take my extra 10 seconds because I do have to go. I'm sorry, but thank you so much for um, having me tonight. It was a real pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you to the Hunter students. Um, I hope we, you learned a lot and learned about what the DA does and what your next DA can do for you. Um, I think this was really informative and I appreciate the opportunity for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to Diana Florence with the same question on prosecuting sex work. Yeah, as, as, as someone who has investigated labor trafficking, I understand that it's hard enough to do a trafficking case when the people, the work that they're doing is actually not illegal. So when you have sex trafficking, it's nearly impossible. And frankly, I disagree with Liz. People are not gonna walk into a precinct when they're arrested and suddenly tell that they're being trafficked. It's almost, almost never happens. What we wanna do is we wanna facilitate the ability to do those cases, to really be open to them. And that starts with, with making sure that sex work, workers are not prosecuted. So I absolutely agree with the policy. And frankly, it should have been done a long time ago. It is incumbent upon the district attorney to use um, his her, her powers to actually do things that make us safer. And that means being accessible to everyone, not just the rich and powerful, but everyone. And that includes the most vulnerable among us. That's what I will do as your DA, make sure that no matter who you are, where you live, or how much money you have, you have access to our office. Thank you. Alvin Bragg, same question to you, 60 seconds. Uh, I agree with what the advance has done. I think it's long overdue. I'm deeply disturbed by the racial disparities in this context as, as, as they really are throughout the criminal justice system. But here, I also uh, think what the Vice Squad is doing is, is horrific from that perspective. Uh, more than 80% of the people arrested for either buying 
or, or selling sex are non-white. Uh, we know that that does not match uh, uh, the marketplace of folks who are doing that. Uh, and so I would dismantle the white squad uh, and I would focus on, 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 on not on consensual sex, but on real harm, the kind of cases I've done throughout my, 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 um, my career. I'm thinking about at the U.S. Attorney's Office, we, you know, we, we were focusing on uh, people who were preying on runaways uh, you know, in Port Authority and doing real human trafficking. That's where we should be using the force of the, of the DA's office, uh, not, not where it is now. The policy does not go far enough, and it's belated. Thank you. Tahani Abushi, go ahead. I think first and foremost, uh, credit here is 100% due to our activists, Decrim New York, Red Canary Song, organizers on the ground that forced this to happen, uh, that forced the um, uh, banning the Walking Wall Trans Bill to make sure that um, sex work is fully decriminalized. And so what Vance is doing is finally heeding to that pressure. Um, and it's not decriminalization of sex work, but he's embarking on that path and we should continue um, under my administration to work for full decriminalization across the board. And this is an, also an opportunity to, again, use this office as a bully pulpit to work with our um, activists and organizers on the ground, our legislators and say, how are we gonna do things better? How are we going to ensure we remove that criminal penalties that we're ensuring a safe line of communication for those that need help. Um, and that we're not intrusion on adult consensual uh, consensual behavior. Um, and I chime in with the rest of my colleagues here that we absolutely have to disband the NYPD vice unit that has preyed upon people of color in the LGBTQ community as well. So we can extend our advocacy over to police reform. Thank you. And lastly, we'll hear from Lucy Lang on the same question. Private consensual sex between adults should not be criminalized. And this is a great example of the discretionary power of the district attorney's office. So the new policy says that the district attorney's office will not prosecute people who are engaged in prostitution. But I will go further and extend that and stop the prosecution of people who patronize prostitutes, uh, people engaged in sex work consensually, and also look back and seal and ex expunge and seal old convictions for those kinds of of crimes which we now know have really terrorized black and brown communities and it has been a racial and gender justice problem. I will, however, invest in investigating and prosecuting human trafficking. And that includes building out a trauma-informed witness aid services unit that can help identify human trafficking where it happens, that increases avenues of reporting, uh, including opening up the uptown offices to in-person intake. And that's my commitment as your district attorney. Thank you very much. So we are over time, which means that I'm making an executive decision not to do closing statements. I'm sorry to you all, but um, in 15 minutes, we have another debate, the mayoral debate on New York One, and I know everyone wants to go and watch that, including myself. So um, we're going to wrap up. Um, I really appreciate you all for sticking out to the end and to the 159 people who are still here watching. Amazing. Um, thank you to the Roosevelt House. Thank you to Hunter College. Thank you to our students who asked amazing questions. Um, and thank you all for being here. It was a great event.